Disco Liberation Movement number 96. I'm preoccupied with questions of liberation again. No surprises there. Looking through some of my old writing from the 90s, I see that I continually examine whether or not a person can change, grow, and adapt. And I express horror at the idea that change, growth, and new adaptation might be impossible. In my writings, I express anxiety about what would happen if I just stayed the same way forever. The reason I was particularly anxious was because I was aware that I seemed to cohabitate in my body, mind, and soul with some specific energies and characters with whom I was not exactly in love. Which is to say I felt oppressed by these other energies operating at will inside my consciousness. Jung explains that all of us are connected to the collective unconscious through the advent of our personal psyches. The objective psyche is like a giant circle that encompasses all of consciousness, and the personal psyche, with the ego at its center, is just one small portion of awareness existing within this much larger and much more powerful sphere of transpersonal consciousness. This is why we can say that we are one with God, because we are inside the sphere of God's domain. People get confused by this kind of language because when I say God, they immediately think of all the ideas they've been taught about God. So here, here's some ideas about God, right? He's more powerful than we are, right? And we're supposed to trust in him and his awesome power, right? He has a plan for our lives that we can't always see, right? But he's all-knowing and all-powerful, and so we, humble mortals that we are, have to submit to his decrees and gratefully accept our fate, knowing that God loves us and will always lead us toward the light. Okay, so these are the usual ideas people believe about God. So what I'm saying here isn't that different. It just happens on the metaphorical level of psychic consciousness. Here, God is one giant sphere of awesome psychic power called the collective unconscious in Jungian psychology. And we, the part we think of as me, is the ego sitting inside the smaller circle of the personal psyche, which is sitting inside this much larger circle of the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious, or the transpersonal objective psyche, is the power that knows much more than we do about our fate. We're sitting inside of it, so it knows us more than we know it. It's the power that loves us and wants the best for us. It's the power that guides us and leads us toward the light, quote unquote, the light. It's just a psychological reality and and it possesses the sorts of qualities we want to project outward into some idea of a man-god sitting in heaven somewhere. But did you ever wonder why God is always in heaven? It's an image that shows how God is bigger than we are. How God's realm and our our own human realm are, are somewhat different. But this is exactly how it is in the broader collective psyche. Our personal spheres of consciousness that are concerned primarily with ego's perceptions about what life is are totally separate from the much vaster realm of the collective unconscious. So this is we see this in our dreams sometimes. There are dreams that take place in the personal psyche or are concerned with the personal realm of experience. And these in these dreams, we often see people that we can recognize, faces, people, in, um, you know, like our, our wife or our, our son or our dog or whatever. And then the further out we go into the non-personal sphere of the psyche, we start to see images of stranger people and flying creatures and, um, you know, non-human entities. And this is how it is generally in the, in the psyche. So the closer we move toward God or toward the depths of the universal transpersonal psyche, the farther away we get from personal concerns. And when we do this, when we move toward God, we become less petty, less freaked out about the millions of day-to-day mundanities in our, in our little human lives. We get bigger and fuller and richer the more we let go of personal ego 
and get closer to seeing things from this more universal, transpersonal, and godly dimension. So going back to this anxiety about what would happen if we never grew or changed or adapted, this is the basic trajectory of growth and maturity, getting closer to and fuller of God. Fuller with God, I guess. But not everyone gets there, I'm afraid. Some people go to their graves never meeting God, never reaching this higher level of consciousness because they just stay in the mundane world of the ego. Most religious practices can give us that. They can give us the pleasures of the flesh and the desires of the ego. And once a week, they give us a little bit of holiness and a sense that we have some God in our lives. And then that's that. But for some people, that's not enough. For some people, total liberation from delusion is the only thing worth pursuing. And disco liberation movement is for those people. The people who know what they know is not the whole story and are desperate to know what reality really is, what life is really about. For me personally, there's nothing more nauseating than wasting our one life getting nose jobs and buying cars. But hey, to each their own, right? Each of us has a certain karmic pattern that we're living out in this life. And the psyche is there to heal, help each of us find our specific path. Actually, the specificity of karmic path is another reason we can help ourselves become totally liberated. When we can accept that someone else has their own path, then we don't feel as anxious about needing to save them or lead them in the right direction. You know, your path is your path, my path is my path. There are a million pathways to God. I'm speaking to myself here, of course, because I often feel the need to lead people to higher ground. But this gets confusing and problematic when I myself am stuck in the mud of deluded thinking and stormy emotions. Because, you know, on the one hand, I feel that I'm following the call of some holy calling. And then on the other hand, I'm still just a human filled with error. But this is the central paradox of awakening, I think. Because we're both deluded and awakened at the same time. And just because one is ascendant doesn't mean the other has disappeared completely. And we can't stop striving just because we're as yet imperfect. There is no perfection that can be achieved. We live in an imperfect world of cause and effect. Although lots of, lots of Zen people would argue with that statement. But we won't get into it just now. All we can do is live in the present moment and accept what comes as a potential gift. I saw this great TED talk yesterday. This really cool Shaolin monk who lives in Europe was talking about the five hindrances to total awakening. The first is sensual desire. So whatever we get addicted to through our five senses, uh, which are what seeing, hearing, touching, feeling, and smelling. Food, sex, clothing, TV, cars, houses, shoes, whatever. The stuff we consume through our five senses. Any sort of overdoing it in any of these areas will become a major hindrance to awakening. We have to have enough discipline to forego desires of the body by being sensible. Few of us need as much food and coffee and snacks and beer as we actually consume. Few of us need as many clothes and shoes and jackets and sweaters as we actually possess. Few of us need to eat out at restaurants and watch as much TV as we actually do. There's nothing really more disgusting, hedonistic, and dark than our consumption habits in this country, to be honest. No wonder so many people can be characterized as distinctly unawakened. The second hindrance is ill will or aversion. We can't walk the long path of awakening if we're always coddling ourselves and our likes and dislikes. If we, wait, if we hate to wake up early, then we'll stay in the darkness. If we hate to work hard and want to be lazy instead, we'll never change. If we want to spend more time criticizing others and not enough time on cultivating wholesome habits, then we are hindered in our process of awakening. Negative thoughts, words, and deeds all stop us from climbing the mountain of total liberation. So training the mind to see its own habits and changing them is a major part of the process of transformation. It's the same in Jungian psychology. We engage with the images of the deep psyche and the ones that are too destructive and too negative get the axe. They're not allowed to just run amok in the mind or the soul doing whatever they want and dragging us around with them. 
This is what the Buddhists call the monkey mind, untrained, vulgar, and uncivilized. To be civil means to have deep respect and reverence for all beings and for life itself. I know that some people might object to the word civilized because they think it has to do with the way white people came along and dominated other non, non-white cultures. But to those people, I would just suggest looking at the insides of their own brains to see how many incorrect and incomplete ideas are dominating their thoughts and beliefs. Civilized means deeply respectful and reverential toward the life of all beings. So the negative, hateful, greedy monkey mind is an uncivilized mind. It only cares about its own prerogatives, which are totally uncouth. The next hindrance is dullness or heaviness. This is for the mind and the body and the soul, since they're all one entity. Lazy, heavy, sleepy, unmotivated. These qualities in body or mind will keep us from achieving the mountaintop of full awakening. We have to reject this tendency by cultivating wholesome habits. Good clean food, enough sleep, regular exercise, and the avoidance of anything that takes away our inner peace and our zest for life. Millions of people in this country are being swallowed whole by their TV and streaming devices and services. I'm so tired of hearing people talk about what TV show they just watched on Netflix or what movie they saw on Amazon Prime. Please, this is not life. This is mental, emotional, psychological, and physical drudgery. Most people couple these consumption habits with cheesy fatty pizzas and chicken wings and sugary drinks. No wonder everyone's exploding at the seams and all anyone can do is muster enough strength to send a nasty tweet. I would recommend instilling a steady diet of discipline. For myself, I've been doing it one habit at a time. I was told recently that my wood energy is out of control. Unbalanced wood is anger and aggression. I knew I was struggling with these energies, so I started doing Qigong, and I'm taking some medicinal herbs that encourage letting go and instilling calmness and assuaging, you know, lingering grief. I'm also taking more time to just enjoy my day, especially in the mornings. It's springtime, it's kind of amazing outside, it's really helping. Hindrance number four is restlessness what the monk called the fast and unsettled mind. This is the mind that's always racing to and fro from idea to idea, thought to thought, memory to memory, past to future, back to the past, back to the future. What's going to happen to me? That's the main, main, the almost the central fire burning in, in, in this mind. Me, me, me. What about me? In the Three Pillars of Zen, Philip Kaplow explains that the tendency of this mind is to burn itself out through the, quote, ceaseless production of useless thoughts, unquote. What this does is take up a lot of energy that could be used for other things, if only we had enough discipline to keep that energy to use for more productive purposes. Most people have no idea this is even happening. But if you listen to that voice in your head that's always talking, that's what I'm talking about. If you pay attention to it, you'll see that it never stops yammering away. And all that yammering, that's all your psychic energy just leaking away all day, taking all of your personal power with it, leaving you uncentered and susceptible to the blowing winds of total insanity. This is why in all spiritual practices, meditation techniques are taught to silence that crazy mind and take back personal power and dignity. There are millions of people with this kind of mind of craziness. People who are like oxen, yoked to the insane power of this mind, who still have the audacity to talk about going out there and getting our freedom back. The irony is breathtaking. So you got to train hard if you want to reach the summit, and you won't get there with a mind that controls you. That's not self-mastery. That's enslavement to a mental tendency You never even stop to question. The last hindrance is skeptical doubt. The monk explained that this manifests as perpetual indecision. What if I do this? What if I do that? Being wishy-washy, indecisive, always doubting whether we're on the right path. I think anyone can see why this kind of attitude would hinder any sort of accomplishment. We can't just keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 
We have to be decisive. We have to figure out what it is we love to do and then dedicate our lives to doing it. No matter what it is, that's the only way to go. And we have to work at liberating our minds, our bodies, and our souls from the restrictive and debilitating tendencies characterized by these five hindrances to total awakening. I think I've mentioned on more than one occasion that I deleted all my social media accounts a while ago. I'm on week three of no news. I also don't watch TV anymore. I caught off my cable yesterday and deleted the streaming apps off of my devices. For relaxing and entertainment, I watch football. I like football because it doesn't really have an agenda. It's just about the game. And some, I also watch like some wholesome programs like the TED Talk I just told you about. I'm determined not to let the world of stupidity to enter my consciousness anymore. I'm carefully picking and choosing what content is permitted to enter my mind. Slowly, I'm working to purify my body and my soul and my mind from the countless poisons that our world is drenched in. I don't do it because I think I'm so special and holier than thou. I do it because I'm starting to see that I am you and you are me. And what we do and eat and think and say affects all of us. If we want the world to be cleaner and more peaceful and if we want freedom and equality for all, then we will achieve these realities first inside our own selves. There are people out there screaming and yelling and raising their fists in pursuit of freedom and liberation who can't even liberate themselves from their never-ending scrolling habit. They can't even liberate themselves from eating 4,000 calories a day despite the extreme weight problem. Can't even stop themselves from sending hate tweets or even putting their phone down for 10 minutes. Well... Sorry if I don't bend over backwards trying to take lessons from you about what it means to be free.